Hello, and welcome to the Department of Theology and Religious Studies here in the University of Nottingham, and another in our Why Study series. And today I'm joined by Professor Anthony Thistleton, who is going to answer the question, Why Study Hermeneutics? Professor Thistleton has written umpteen books on the subject. In fact, there are eight of them that I can think of offhand, and so he's eminently suited to answer this question. Welcome, Tony. Thank you. And without more ado, why study hermeneutics? Hermeneutics in general is how to understand texts that are written in another time or another place, but biblical hermeneutics is especially how to understand texts of the Bible, but not just to understand them, really to engage with them. Uh, that's why the book in your hand is actually called The Two Horizons, because we have to link up in hermeneutics the viewpoints in the biblical authors. I, d I call it horizons rather than viewpoints because horizons change and move with the horizon of the modern reader. So that book, The Two Horizons, is to sum up how the horizon of scripture can be helped to engage with the horizon of the modern reader. Can you give me an example of the horizon of the, the biblical author and then how it interacts with the horizon of someone like myself? Well, let's take an example from that book, which is uh, near the beginning, I talk about the parable of the publican and the Pharisee. Uh, Jesus says that the uh, publican is put right with God more easily than the Pharisee. Nowadays, it would be like water off a duck's back for many people because they'd expect that the Pharisee would be thought of as hypocritical and so on. When you start exploring the text, you find that it's an incredible reversal of expectations. The Pharisee was doing his best as a righteous man, but the Pharisee asked for forgiveness. So the impact of the parable is quite other than a superficial reading would suggest. The word hermeneutics, as soon as you utter it, yes. suddenly creates in many people's minds a mist. Yes. Oh dear, I don't understand yes. that. And yes. the most dreadful phrase is, oh, there are her the hermeneutical overtones. Yes. Tell me, can you can you help can you help us to a, can you help us with this word hermeneutics? Yes. Because there is a crucial difference between interpretation and hermeneutics. Interpretation is actually doing interpretation. Hermeneutics is the theory of how we ought to be interpreting. Therefore, it involves, as I tell my students in lesson one, not just biblical studies, not just philosophy, but plenty of philosophy because that's how we understand, plenty of linguistics because that's what's happening with the language, plenty of literary theory because literary theorists talk about narrative and parable a great deal, even sociology because the interests that you have and the historical condition, this or the class and gender and place into which you were born, make a terrific difference to how the biblical writing strikes you. So all the best books on hermeneutics are thoroughly interdisciplinary, which wouldn't be the case with interpretation. And one of the interesting things is that we have, some, someone has said that we have been condemned in the late, in, in modernity to be to engage in hermeneutics because we have become so aware of our own context. What is the, what, how important is context when I'm reading a text? Yes, I think it is. The biblical context is very, very important and that should be one of the things at the heart of biblical studies. But so is our own context and that's why in departments of theology all over the country, attention is not only given to the Bible, but to the situatedness or how a person approaches things, which makes an enormous difference to how they understand. I mean, one of the um, examples I choose to show students how practical hermeneutics is, um, I wrote a small book called um, Can the Bible Mean Anything We Want It to Mean? In a way, the answer is both yes and no. I mean, it's a misuse of hermeneutics that it can mean anything we want it to mean. 
But on the other hand, it's not just a straight jacket, one meaning, one place forever and ever. Uh, there are variables to the subject as well. You have also written a, on the hermeneutics of doctrine. Oh, yes. And one of the problems that faces anyone who's studying theology is the awareness of how what's, what's, what's seemingly the crucial issue on which stands or falls Christianity yes. in one generation, in the next generation, is not yes. important. Yes. Can yes. you talk to me about the hermeneutics of doctrine? Um, I wrote that book because in so many seminaries and universities, doctrine is considered not by the staff, but by many students, as dull and unimportant. And I think that's because it's regarded so often as something static and completely unchanging. There is always a dialectic between what changes and what is of permanent worth in doctrine. And the hermeneutics of doctrine is concerned with what kind of questions we ask of doctrine. So the aim of the book was to use a study of hermeneutics to bring doctrine alive. One of the things that a historian of theology is often accused of is, of course, that seeing how meaning changes, yes. then everything is relative. Yes. Uh, we both know that it's not as simple as that. It isn't, yes. Neither is it, nor is it as simple as that it's just written in stone. Yes. So how, how would you express this, this complex relationship between not, be, not being relative and yet not being absolutist? <laughs> you, you need about 40 lectures to explain it. Okay, um, I, I'm going to put the, the ultimate challenge to you. Can you do it for me in one minute? <laughs> I'm not sure I can. Um, you're quite right that there is a relativity to the culture that we belong to. There is also a permanence to the message. And the question, of course, is how does the permanence relate? Now, one of the things I've said in Hermeneutics of Doctrine is that what the answer will be depends not on doctrine in general, but what kind of text we're looking at, what kind of doctrine we're looking at. So the answer is complex because it depends on what the specific example is. We live in a pluralist society. Yes. We live in a world where we are, um, where we, we, we can't turn on the news, but we are aware of just how much difference. Yeah. How does hermeneutics help us to confront the sheer variety that is part of our world that wouldn't have been part of the world of even our grandparents? It does. Um, I think this is perhaps the only quote I'm going to give you. There's a professor of law um, on the continent, Emilio Betti, who says that the great value of hermeneutics is that it helps us to see not what another view is, but why somebody has arrived at it. So if you constantly ask why somebody believes what they believe, not first of all whether it's right or wrong, eventually whether it's right or wrong, yes, but if you ask why, he says, his words are, hermeneutics should be compulsory for every university student because nothing teaches you better respect for the other tolerance and how to listen to the other. I think that's a, a very helpful way of looking at it. Professor Anthony Thistleton, you have answered the question in one minute and I think we should just leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom.